Right, hello and welcome to this special edition of Take the Fear Out of the Gear with me, Mr Chumley Warner. And I'm Peter Goldsmith. And me, Jason Bangers. This is all about a, uh, a World War II oscilloscope. Right, so here we are with Peter. And this is a World War II oscilloscope. And the viewers may be asking, how did we come across this? Well, it all started when I saw a Facebook advert on the Facebook marketplace and uh, I saw this and thought well we're, we're into restoring uh, sort of old items and stuff like that and one of Peter's uh, stipulations that would be the word wouldn't yes. it <laughs> stipulations was t if anyone has it they've got to cherish it look after it and hopefully get it working again yeah. and obviously it take the fear of the gear this is what we do we get a lot of old equipment and we restore it uh, with our friend Alan the Great's help, our engineer, because he's, he's the valve man. So uh, we'll let you know a bit later on how we get on with that. But for the moment, Peter, uh, can you tell us a bit of the history? Because I believe you're in the Navy yes. and your father and your grandfather. So yeah. how did you actually come across this uh, oscilloscope? Well, uh, you're right about the Navy. So I've always loved boats, ships, and, uh, and electronics was the other thing I was keen on as, as a child. Uh, so I went straight from school into the Navy um, at the age of 17 um, and keen to do electronics so I studied as a radio electrical artificer and uh, that meant communications, single sideband, radar, that sort of thing. So it was around 1964 I was at HMS Collingwood in Fareham uh, learning, the, learning the trade oh, and, wow. uh, and, and learning about radar and uh, communications. We even had VHF communications in those days. And, um, and my instructor uh, said, um, came to me one day after the classes and said, I, I know you're keen, I've got this old oscilloscope, would you like it? You know? And I, of course I said, yes, of course. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so this, um, this uh, unit, appeared uh, it's very heavy as you know yeah. and um and uh, and i took it home to my parents uh, i was still um uh, still a teenager at that time and um living with my parents um but i had great fun with it uh, i was e e interested also in uh, particularly in recording voice recordings and things like that yeah, yeah yeah so for audio recordings it's not high frequency but it worked it worked wonderfully uh, and i had uh, i had great time well, uh, the years move on. Yeah? So, as I say, this was 1964, and um, uh, then uh, I served on an aircraft carrier. Couldn't take it on board, obviously, so it was stowed again. Uh, and then, at, in the early 70s, I had my own marine electronics business, and there I did use it on some things. Yeah. Um, it was particularly good on audio things. You could see clipping of amplifiers and things like that. Uh, and then life moves on. Get married, um, have children. Because you, you, you said it, it has moved around a lot. It's moved and, around. And, and with most people, when things start moving around, you never see them going. So you, you've done very no, well to hold no, on to it. Well, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a bit of a hoarder of things, as my parents always used to complain. So, uh, yes, it, um, when we moved, when we had in Cornwall, that was fine. I had a workshop. When we moved from there, it actually ended up in the loft, and that was in Surrey. Right. Um, and then, uh, then my marriage... Um, uh, came to an end so it, uh, it I think it moved um, for a while back to my parents and then I lived in um, Colchester for a while uh, for some years went sailing it was in another loft um, and then it came here to Wivenhoe and it went in the loft again and lockdown meant that I was having a serious clear out yeah yeah um, and uh, things had to go and I was determined that if possible, we could find a home for it, which somebody would not just consider it a scrap, but, and, and then we met. Well, and, uh, there's a lot of history behind these things. Uh, and as I say, when we've got a video of the repair coming up probably next week, but some of the capacitors in there, they, they said on the 1941. Yes. Uh, we've still got them all, we haven't thrown them Have away. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah we, we don't throw anything away, no. but we, we've got the yeah. capacitors, you know, we, if anyone's we into... We our hoarders. <laughs> we are, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, it, yes, I mean, you've, uh, you've got the manual. The manual is, it was printed in 1943, at Marconi in Chelmsford, which incidentally was, the, was the, my alternative to the Navy, because it was close to home, and it was, it was electronics and marine related. Uh, that was the alternative as a, um, 
uh, as a career, but the Royal Navy won. Um, yes, so the, even even the original circuit diagrams are here. Um, and this, with, with the repair, it, it would have been really difficult about this because yes. obviously Alan yeah. who actually lives in Chelmsford knows Does all he? about Marconi oh I see and we've got a whole load of uh, <laughs> we've got a whole load of uh, there's all the circuit diagrams yes. and all the instructions in there yes so uh, yes I, I have looked after it um, you, you haven't mentioned but it, it even amazingly came with a spare tube and this is a, a double beam um, CRT quite long and it comes in a canvas bag with corners which means you it comes in a box with springs I, I never got the box uh, or, or if I did it disappeared yeah. but this was the this was the backup tube and, uh, and it's called, all our training in those days was in valves we didn't yeah. have any transistors no, no, uh, no the Navy didn't have transistors in, in the uh, uh, in the late 60s or early 60s um, no so all our radar was all valves there was a computer on HMS Eagle that was valve based, wired in valves. Yeah? A, bit, a bit like the ones in Bletchley Park I've seen where yes. they are virtually yes. all valves. Yeah. Yes, yeah. and this whole computer uh, took up a vast amount of space and a huge amount of power um, and hardly ever had a completely working um, system because some boards were failing. But it was an amazing piece of kit. So that's, that's the background and, and of course all this has come an awfully long way since I yeah, and, and you were telling us earlier about this radar, which, which, <laughs> which drew a huge amount of power and had to be in an oil bath. Yes, well, the, um, the uh, radars I was working on in the fleet air arm, which is where I spent a lot of time, were, um, were very powerful. So it was called air early warning. And the aircraft was a twin rotating propeller, Gannet, oh, with okay. a great bulge underneath it. And this, this contained the uh, antenna. And it was so powerful, you never were allowed to run it on the ground. It ran into a dubby load. It had a peak power of 2 megawatts. Blimey. It had a range of over 200 miles with a crystal clear picture um, because of the height. Is that, is that 2 million watts? 2 yes. megawatts? Yes, 2 million two watts. Million watts. Good grief. Yes, it's a, it's a very short pulse, uh, but it's very high powered and it's, and it's very destructive if you're anywhere near it. We, we were shown a film taken on a, an American carrier where uh, they accidentally did much the same as that. And what it did was it, it triggered off bombs that were hanging underneath aircraft on the flight deck. And then one aircraft on another exploded. Oh, blimey. And uh, they, uh, they lost nearly all the aircraft on the deck because they'd switched the radar on. The, the power is so great uh, that, of, of a pulse like that that it can penetrate almost anything. So things like, um, things like bombs with se sensitive triggers um, would uh, almost I inevitably be fired. So you can imagine an aircraft sitting on a flight deck where it's surrounded by other aircraft. If one bomb drops off, it basically it bounces along the deck until it hits something. Normally, in this well, no, say normally in this case, another aircraft, in which case that aircraft explodes. So we were we were shown this as a, as a horror film in a sense. Do not do this. The frequency band for uh, that radar was about three, three gigahertz, uh, three gigahertz transmission from um, X band is ten, S band is three. That was quite serious, bad planning. Well, it, it, it was bad planning, it was a mistake. Yeah. Um, uh, we, we, everybody's given clear instructions um, uh, that that, wow. that that is not allowed to happen. There's a dummy load built in on board, you can easily switch it over, um, and it's clearly labelled, all that sort of thing, but it, it happens. So that, that's all valve theory, and, and the this enormous magnetron that sat in the bottom um, I can't remember it, but it, its heater drew something like 60 amps um, and uh, it sat in a bath of oil. Uh, and if there was any air in the oil at all, uh, it would burn. So uh, you had to let the oil settle for usually 24 hours before you ever switched it on. It was quite a piece of kit. kit. Um, of course, technology has changed a lot, but that was, in the day, it was very effective, very effective. Normally, uh, a marine radar has a range of 16 or 32 miles maximum. But put up an aircraft that high, it has a range of over 200 miles. I served on an aircraft carrier, which was some 50, 60,000 tons. It's a big ship. 
maximum complement to everybody on board is two and a half thousand people, 50 aircraft, it's oh. a whole floating village. And yet, in, in, a, uh, in an open sea, um, a, a big ship still rises and falls. Um, and uh, one of the tasks I had was looking after the library, which was right in the bow of the ship underneath the flight deck. And across the Bay of Biscay, going, going down to the Mediterranean for the winter, uh, we had heavy seas. And I remember thinking after 15 or 20 minutes, oh, I'm not staying here any longer. It was like rush up and down in a lift, getting oh. to the top and then sinking again very fast. Right, so we were talking about training earlier on and mm. you were saying uh, how the instructors, they used to give you well, equipment and stuff with faults on it. Yeah. And you were saying about a particular <laughs> funny, <laughs> funny one they did to the class. Yeah, well, we always remember. The, 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 the training in the Navy um, is very good. Um, I'm not naturally academic, uh, I'm more practical, uh, but the training was five years um, from start to finish. So the first part is basic training. Yeah? You march up and down, um, yeah. you do all that sort of thing. Um, but then you get selected into various groups and all, that's what I always wanted to do. So uh, once I was in the electrical stream, the next part of that, uh, once we were past the basic electrical was uh, which division and I wanted to be in the fleet air arm. I, right. I wanted to fly, but I never did. Um, so, uh, but the instruction takes you through various stages, from the simple stages. But uh, it, it was it was interesting with fault finding because you have these sort of standard bits of kit, and, and I'm yeah. talking about all valve equipment. Yeah. And um, and this uh, instructor said, "Okay, uh, there's a fault on your equipment. Um, uh, I want you to uh, find out what it is." And I think there was probably four of us. So the first thing we did with this piece of equipment, I can't remember what it was, it looked like a power supply, but um, was uh, to find out what's wrong with it, plugged it in. Immediately, all the lights went, bang, um, oh, all the power <laughs> went, yes. Uh, because this uh, instructor had decided uh, to put a wire across the plus and the minus in the power plug. Right. Uh, and hadn't even mentioned a sort of caution of, do you want to do any tests before you uh, actually plug it in? Yeah. And so we were, very, let's say, uh, fairly new and um, innocent. Uh, this caused some uh, consternation because it took quite a long while to get the power back on um, and our class was there. But uh, the, the, so the training goes on to more specialised things and, and then you spend a, a portion of time working on the job, so to speak. So yeah. I went, I served on a, a squadron of air early warning uh, aircraft the, the the radars with you know the radar with the big um the big uh, dish and the very big power yeah um and we had early navigation equipment also it was called tacan which is tactical air navigation with a big drum on the top of the mast and it spins and it sends out a series of sine waves uh from which you can get a reference signal and therefore an angle Right. Okay. Um, and uh, so the aircraft could use it like a homing beacon. But before we had anything um, ground-based, I mean, we had later we had uh, DECA, and then after after that we had uh, GPS. But that was very very late. And those yeah. days we didn't have anything like that. So those were the sort of equipments that we learnt on. But as I say, this is all sixties-based equipment and all valve equipment. So it was very interesting. So would you say? It must be easier to work on like like this oscilloscope and that type of equipment. Yes. Because what we've noticed now is all these like surface mount components. Yes. Which you can't even see. I, can, <laughs> I, I wouldn't want to work on any of this modern stuff because no. it's just it's just. I can give you an example. The, in, in, the uh, gannet with the air early warning radar had two observers behind the pilot sitting looking at screens, um, and um, and once in a while uh, they would say, "Chief, my uh, screen's not working." And one of the common faults was that um, one of the valves had failed. So you, you, could, you could squeeze your hand down the side um, and feel them. Oh, right, okay. That one's cold. Pull it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Plug another one in. And he thought I was a genius. Yeah? Because uh, it was so, his problem was so, he's, oh, this was faulty. Plug it back in. And it, as you say, <laughs> yeah, these days it? you can't do that sort of thing. No. In those days, uh, it, things can be relatively straightforward. You could, you could solve down to component level quite, quite straightforwardly. So the good news, Peter, <laughs> we've, we've taken the oscilloscope to uh, my brother-in-law, Alan the Great, as we call him. He's, he's into valves and all the rest of it. 
So we've actually fixed it. That's amazing. So I, uh, I, I can't tell you how pleased I am. It's really amazing. Yeah. And obviously, we'd like to do a full restoration on it because at the moment, it's you know it needs some repainting, a new handle, and some bits and pieces. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've we've got a repair video coming up, Great. which we'll put together so that will you can see yeah. what's been changed, but yeah. like capacitors and there's valves yeah. been changed. Yeah. Wonderful. So so Alan's uh, Alan's been for it and it all it all works. Uh, we need to find a couple of parts for it. There, the control parts on the front there. Yeah. If we can find another one, yeah. then we can get it 100% because we've had to do a little mod on it. Uh, where the power switch was but apart from that it's all working it's brilliant absolutely brilliant well done uh, simon uh well uh, yeah when and oh, alan, well, is, well, alan, alan, alan yeah. is alan is our resident expert but, on but everything you took well. it on i mean so i, mean, so I yeah. think it's a uh, i think it's, no it's, it's it's really pleasing that we, we were talking earlier about the fact of um uh, making uh, making things work and not just throwing them away and starting again and it's so, it's so uh, satisfying that I've had this all these years yeah I, I, what's it, it's, I can't remember it's, it's over 50 years yeah in yeah. fact it's getting on for 55 years that I've had it uh, and uh, that you could have got it uh, you and Alan could have got it working and I think it's just brilliant and yes. as I say, Peter's had this <laughs> for longer than we've been alive. Because <laughs> we're, we're yeah, yeah. I'm 55 yeah. and, and Jay's 54. 54. Yeah. So it's yeah. this this little escape has been around longer than us by, by quite a while. Yeah. I was born in 68 and you're talking well, about things. And I'm yeah, I was, well, I was born in 45. So uh, I was two years old when this was born. <laughs> yeah. But it's, yeah. Just, it's just lovely to get a piece of history working again yes I, I think it's great I'm, I'm all power to you i'm i'm so uh, i'm so pleased i can't tell you i really am uh, it, it means a lot to me it, it, because it was a sort of a key thing in my i don't know my life yeah yeah, um, yeah. Jo joining the navy and and learning the electronics that i did um serving on aircraft carrier making sure aircraft were ready to fly um all that stuff was um uh was was a key part of my life but it sort of uh, sounds a bit strong but it made me it made me I was a very quiet and shy really um, and it turns you into a bit of a leader uh, as yeah. a chief you have to lead other people it's a, it's a necessary thing and uh, so so uh, uh, that and the electronics um, and of course the sailing uh, so uh, so it all combined because the Navy gave me a lot of sailing as well. Well Pete thanks very much for that um, it's been very enlightening and thanks for coming on our show very, 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 Welcome. we're very <laughs> humble, don't we, Simon? That's just an well, amazing story. From this episode of Take the Fear Out of the Gear, it's goodbye from me, Jason Bangers. And it's goodbye from me, Mr. Chumley Warner. And it's goodbye from me, Peter Goldsmith. Peter Goldsmith.